All right. Welcome to episode six of the Commissioner Show. I'm here with founder and commissioner of MLW Wiffle Ball, Kyle Schultz. He's on the Mount Rushmore of Wiffle Ball, no doubt about that. Uh, so let's jump straight into it. You know, how did MLW begin? And just tell us that story. Yeah. So first of all, thanks for having me on. And uh, MLW began in the summer of 2009 in my front yard with my two brothers, my two neighbors. Uh, we were just playing pickup wiffle ball like any other kid would in their neighborhood when one day we we uh, had a controversial call in the home run derby that sparked us to put up a makeshift field with a fence and a backstop, the whole thing. Um, and the next summer, we decided to put up some YouTube videos with our just family camcorder. And we just had the time of our lives. We had jerseys made. We had the whole field set up and everything. And um, every single year since 2010, when we started posting videos, uh, the league just kind of gradually began to grow um, just in terms of, you know, word of mouth within our community and some youth baseball teams I've been on and stuff like that to the point now uh, over 12 years now it's been um, you know, we, we uh, have over 50 players that have played in the league, eight current teams and we travel all across the country for various events, but it all started back then in 2010. You mentioned you have 50 where you had 50 players. Yes. Uh, did you ever find getting players as an issue or uh, cause I know that's a problem. A lot of other leagues run into. Yeah, it's a pretty interesting question. Um, I feel like in the early days, we could have gotten more players, but we wanted people that were we knew were going to be dedicated. So um, we we loved the idea of growing, but growing slowly with people we knew we could count on. Um, and that's something I really recommend to wiffle ball leagues that start up is, yeah, it might be nice to have one summer where you have like 50 to 100 kids in your league, but you know some of them don't love it and they don't come back the next year and then you're kind of in a weird spot. Um, we like the idea of having growing through, you know, like mutual friends and friends that really watch the videos and, um, want to join the next year and grow that, that, that kind of slower pace. Um, that's, that's what I would say. And if, if you are having trouble with growing your, your league and your roster sizes and all that stuff, just, just show them the videos to take matters into your own hands and create, create really cool content to the point where they're going to want to be a part of where, whatever you're doing. Um, so whether that's Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, um, kids love these kids love to be on camera these days. So, uh, if you make cool content, they're going to want to be a part of it. They're going to want to join the league. And when they see how much fun you're having doing it, they're, they're going to want to be on board. Yeah. Yeah. We noticed that in ours, like when, uh, sometimes I guess at the beginning of our league, we'd get guys and they wouldn't even know about the YouTube and they go yeah. in a whole other dimension when they find out you got YouTube, Instagram, right. uh, some guys don't even have Instagram. So when we show them that content, uh, they get a lot more excited. Right. Um, right. But obviously, I'm a pretty big MLW fan, and I listen to some of the podcasts where you guys mentioned you guys also played some other, I say, like games or made up some games as you're okay. a kid. So what are some of those? And then like besides wiffle ball uh, and yeah. Um, to be honest with you, a lot of them were just like in my basement where we'd make it up in like the spur of the moment. We played a lot of like mini sticks, like mini hockey for those people that know that. Um, we played like a game called Gaga where you'd form like a ring of like yeah. I don't know, barriers and you try to like hit the ball at people's feet to get them out. We've done mini baseball games. We've done like dunk contests. We play like a lot of mini hoop basketball stuff. So really anything we could think of ranging from baseball related sports to basketball, hockey, like really, you name it. Like we were always doing something in the summers and then obviously wiffle ball, wiffle ball came up in 2009 or 10 and we just ran with that. But, um, yeah, we definitely would like whatever we could get our hands on. We'd make some sort of game out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have, I think that very, we're very in common in that sense that yeah, yeah. we played literally a lot of those games as well. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so next up I got what, uh, like obviously when you started the editing is nowhere near as great as it is now. Now it's, it's literally professional. It's like, it could be featured anywhere you see it on sports center, all that. Uh, how did you like grow and how'd you, like even enjoy editing in the first place and also like graphic design through Instagram. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I've always, I've always had a passion for it. And, you know, obviously when you start out with it, you're not going to be as good as you are 12 years in that just goes with anything you do in life, honestly. Um, so when people say like, how'd you get, like, how's your editing so good? Well, like it's honestly just through experience, you learn what works and what doesn't and you find little tweaks after every single season that you can improve upon. Um, and I didn't go, I didn't take some like course of like how to edit videos. I, I just kind of like did it through the experience and 
Um, you find little tweaks and little things you can change to make it look cooler. And you do some research on other YouTubers, like what they do. And you look into the motion, motion graphics space. And then um, just like Instagram graphic design stuff. Um, it, it's a lot of like little tweaks that when they accumulate, then you start seeing a difference. But it's not like an overnight thing to where my editing um, is good now per se. But um, I would just recommend to everybody who's starting out, just like stay with it. If, if you're If you're not content with your content right now, just stay with it improve upon your craft, just keep trying new things. Um, because I started off and my videos weren't great, but over the past, over the years, they just kind of gradually get better, um, naturally through experience. Yeah. So for someone who doesn't really hear about how long these videos take, what's your average time per video? Yeah. So, so let's say like uh, a regular season video that you'll see in the summer that we post on Friday. Um, I'll usually import all the clips on Sunday night and we have about four or five camera angles that I got to do that with. And it takes kind of a while actually, when you have that much uh, footage to go through. And then Monday I try to crank out the intro. It takes about a whole day. And I try to get into game one. Um, and for those who don't know, we have three games in our, in our video. So I try to get into game one on the Monday, Tuesday, I try to finish game one and get into game two Wednesday. It's pretty much finished all of game two and get as much done with game three as possible and then Thursday is kind of like my finalizing day. So I'll finalize game three and then I'll put the score bug in last um, with all the little sound effects. That's like my final little touch. Um, and I'll, I'll complete it on Thursday and I'll upload it to YouTube on Thursday night. Um, and I'll do like the little schedule upload. So on Friday, I'm not stressed out and I can focus on the Instagram promotion and YouTube community page promotion on the Friday. Um, and a lot of times in the summer, we'll be traveling on Friday too. So that's why I like to get my videos done on Thursday. Um, but really, it's a four or five day process every single time for my videos in the in the thick of the summer. Oh, uh, with the scoreboard bug, just a curious thing. Do you make yeah. each single, uh, like, like, um, uh, each thing for each at bat, like separate, or do you have like a template you can like put in? No. Yeah. It's, uh, every single change is a new PNG oh. that I create. So I have to tweak it and then save it as a PNG or whatever. And then I place it right next to it in the, in premiere. And it looks like it's like one consistent thing, yeah. but no, that's like every single change is a, a new, uh, a new, uh, photo like file yeah with our new i like we actually have a like we're trying to get a new score bug this year or mm -hmm. this season so we got a after effects package that should hopefully make it a little bit quicker because nice. you can like put it into premiere pro so that's dope yeah, hopefully it speeds up some editing time yeah yeah uh, yeah go ahead no i that's pretty cool uh so this is a big one obviously it's called the commissioner show so how do you balance being a commissioner while playing in the league? Like, obviously you don't want to overpower, you know, your team, but like, how do you balance those two? Um, yeah, it's kind of a weird balance. Um, my biggest thing is I want the the league to be as, is have as much parity as possible. So in the past, I think of one time in like 2017 or 16, it was like, I just came off like two world series titles. And then I added like my like 10 year old neighbors to my, my to my team just to see like how I could, like how much could I take with like less talent and see if we could still win a world series. So sometimes it's, it's kind of fun, but it also is challenging at times. Um, I, I think I do a good job of like balancing it, but most of my time probably goes towards like making every, making sure everything's organized, making sure the videos look good as opposed to making sure my team is as good as possible. Like obviously I'll yeah. scout a little in the off season to where I'll get a guy like Jackson who I'm very confident in. Um, as, as well as Taylor in 2020, but um, most of my time probably is prioritized towards just commission, commissioning the league and uh, as opposed to managing my team. Yeah, uh, for those of you watch BLW here, uh, that was actually a problem for me last year. We, I, I feel like I spent too much time editing or not editing, sorry, like camera production during the series yeah. and not enough like paying attention. So that's actually, I mean, I say that's one of the reasons we got off to a slow start but there's some other things you know yeah it's it's tough sometimes i'll be like so focused on getting the angles i want like the pre-game intro to where the point where i have like no warm-ups and i go out yeah, there exactly. and i walk like the first like three or exactly. four guys and it's like well i definitely should have warmed yeah. up more but we're on a time time constraint here and i have to get this stuff this mm -hmm. stuff done and there's nobody else to look to so you kind of have to give and take like it's uh it's a pros and cons thing um when you run a league like that so i mean that's it is what it is yeah, even a backstory is like before. So actually, our game five of the World Series ended in a walk off, and I right before I gave up the walk off, and I was like all situated with camera angles. I'm like, 
Like if there's any day now, something could happen. I want all these camera angles. Unfortunately, we had some technical issues. So yeah. two of the angles. So we only had the main angle because two others were like, I don't even know, to be honest with you. Mm-hmm. But yeah. Yeah. It's tough. Sometimes you lose footage. I've been there, man. Oh, it's yeah. It's bad. Um, yeah. So next up, I have a question that's like, what do you see MLW down the line from now? Because like, I know you've mentioned on some podcasts, like maybe a facility, a new, like a nicer field or something like that. Uh, so like, what do you see five years from now or something? Like that? Yeah. So I see MLW first, the league growing, um, maybe with an expanded team, like a couple teams within the few next couple years. But yeah, one of my ultimate goal is to have like our own facility where we can house tournaments, leagues, clinics, like the whole thing, um, head of merchandise and everything and all that fulfillment. Um, then I also really love the idea of, of, uh, nationalizing our tur- tournament circuit. Um, so right now we kind of just have like pop-up tournaments across the country, but I kind of want to unionize that and make it more of like a, um, cohesive system to where they build up to where like a, a national championship per se. And they played at the, the MLW stadium or, or something like that. Um, I think that'd be really cool. But in the, in the meantime, I'm really just focused on growing our league as much as possible. And the eight teams we have now and um, focus on getting, a, you know, eight new guys every si- every single draft that are really going to bring value to the league and just really focus on traveling with our tournaments and our um, our cool little series. Like we had like an Oklahoma series last year. I love that idea. Um, and, uh, that's something that you could see, too, is just us taking our league games elsewhere to really cool venues like um, the Shangri-La Resort. So. Um, that's something to keep an eye on too, but, um, uh, things are, things are doing, things are pretty exciting with MLW. I won't lie. It's, it's been fun. Yeah. Sounds exciting for sure. Um, and then, so you actually, you mentioned expansion, which is something I really like to talk about. Yeah. Obviously I'm not going to reveal anything next couple of years, but if you guys were to expand, what are some potential like captains or people you'd see as captains to be the managers of those new teams? Um, I don't know. I haven't put too much thought towards like specific captains or anything like that. I don't want to give anything away, but, um, I don't know guys that have just been in the league for so long that know what it takes to manage a team, um, understand like the serious of the seriousness of it and could, I, I could put my trust into, so I don't know who that may be, but that'd be the criteria. Um, they obviously know it's a very like serious thing now. Like it's a business now. It's not just a thing in our front yard. So whoever that may be in the future, whether that's two more new managers or four or however it might be, um, they, they would understand just how much it would take. Cause it is, it's a lot more work than you think. Like you got to be there pretty much every series you got to deal with, you know, make way with your job or school. You got to make time for MLW. So, um, that'd be some of the criteria we'd look for, but, um, I do have a couple of guys in my mind, but I don't want to, I don't want to share anything right now. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so what's your favorite part of MLW just in general? So like tournaments, uh, meeting fans, editing, playing, all that stuff. Honestly, I think it's meeting the fans. I think it's going to our tournaments and our, our little pop-up events and our out-of-state series and meeting the people that have watched our videos for so long and the people that have really honestly just seen me grow up, honestly, on YouTube. Um, it's really cool to hear like their favorite team, their favorite memories of the league how we inspired them to make a league and how wiffle football is growing in their community. Like that's probably the really honestly, the coolest thing that we've, that I, I hear about every single year. Um, just hearing the stories and the, um, all the, all the fun times that they have because of us, that's probably the pretty, the, the coolest thing that we, uh, we see. Yeah. Uh, so actually when this, when this, uh, interview drops the past week, we'll have our like championship Sunday at Valley West okay. video will drop which is actually me the Saturday before that makes sense. So like, um, we, we go through our first game and then we played you guys and, uh, it's kind of a, yeah. And then you guys played Wifflezilla, obviously. So I kind of want to talk about like, what's the best team because you saw Wifflezilla and they, they are incredible. They were throwing, I think yeah, they were sick. We looked it up. It was like 120 equivalent to MLB or something like that. Yeah. It was something crazy. Mike too. He's insane pitcher. Yeah. And like, like what's your, is that one of the top teams you've ever seen at a tournament? Obviously you've been to like national wiffle ball. You've been to 
like all over the country for football. So like, what are some of the top teams or like, yeah. Right. No. Yeah. I'd say they were definitely up there with the best teams we've seen in an MLW tournament. Um, I'll also put some of the guys we saw in Boston in 2019 in that conversation. Um, we played Jordan Robles. I'm not sure if you know him, but um, he's been playing with ball like his whole life. There's a guy named Kyle Von Slushigen. He throws really hard. Um, just a lot of guys that when you get up to the 90, 92, 93, 4, 95 range, that's like you, you're pretty much just guessing what's going to come out of their hand and you just kind of swing for your life. And then that's kind of what you saw with Whiffzilla too. Like you kind of just have to anticipate the movement of the pitch and just swing away. Um, but Whiffzilla, the team in Boston was called like Paul, Paul Cook's School of Wiffle Ball. Um, but then when you go to like the, yeah, the competitive tournaments, those teams are insane. Uh, we faced a team called the Juggernauts and they have these McHel- McHelrath brothers on the East Coast that are insane. Um, so they're probably probably the best team we've ever faced. Is that the team who won it this year? It is. Yeah, we uh, played them in like the round of 16 or something in the final Sunday bracket and they went on to win, on the, whole, win the whole tournament. So that was definitely yeah. the, the best team we've ever, ever faced. Yeah, I, I actually like, so the team, so Whipplezilla, they had like, I think three absolute studs and some of them didn't even pitch the whole tournament. Yeah. So like the, the tall guy, uh, we're kind of more familiar with him. He, he, like he didn't even pitch against you guys. And he also, I think it was in nationals. He got, he could like carry his team to fourth. I'm pretty sure. They, yeah, I think he also lost. Yeah, he's not like the whippets or something. I think his team is called. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's crazy how good that team was. Yeah, the team is um, deep. They had they had Danny Haverty too. He's a really good hitter and pitcher too. So they were stacked. Yeah, one of them was throwing with like a torn UCL as well. It's it's crazy. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 knew, I knew they were I knew they were gonna be really good like coming into the tournament. They if there was like betting favorites, they would have definitely been the betting favorite. Oh yeah, for sure. And then yeah, I I mean it's crazy because I hear all these stories about these guys who play fast pitch wiffle ball, all the like all the guys at Nationals, they I like heard stories that they they're insane for like two to three years. And then, you know, they hurt their arm or blow out their arm. Yep. But I think it's, I think it's like a good way of how you guys do it. Not just for like the entertainment of the video, but like, it's hard to hit the pitches as well. Yeah. Like, like, uh, crash is hard. We faced you and crash mm-hmm. and facing crash was hard. And then I felt like there was just a huge jump when you came in. Cause I, it was crazy. Like your secondary pitch, I think it was. Mm-hmm. And like the parents were going crazy. They were like, what, what the, the drop ball? Yeah. I was like, <laughs> that thing moves so far left to right there. <laughs> um, like, 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 yeah. It, it's so funny. Cause yeah, me and crash, we have like very different pitching styles. So when you see th- three innings of Ryan and then you come to me in the fourth for like a, a closed situation, it's like, it's hard to like readjust. And we see that in MLW too, like with number one and number two pitchers, like between games one and two and two and three. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's like, that's a huge thing in wiffle ball that not a lot of people think of is like the change of like styles or like rhythm or, or style of pitching, if you will, is, is a really big factor. Oh uh, yeah. I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, it was, I mean, I felt like just in general, like I, I was seeing the ball. That was probably one of the best I've ever hit. Like that day I was just seeing the ball for whatever reason, Yeah, but then I, it's just crazy. Like still how good it's so tough to hit still. And then, like, I go home, like, maybe two hours later, and some of the guys from our team came over. We threw a round, and I'm just like, it's back to normal. I was like, I can't. It's it's just tough. So, I am. Yeah. I'm. I'm happy you recognize like the uh, like that you thought it was a good idea for us to have like the speed limit for like health reasons because you do mention that people blow out their arms, and I that's one of the scariest things in wiffle ball. That if you're growing up playing wiffle ball, you got to stay away from that. You got to stay away from throwing as hard as you can because you're throwing a hollow ball as fast as you can. Like that's not, it's not great for your arm. So um, I really love how we have a speed limit now where we can prevent that entirely. Um, so we, we only go to like one or two fast pitch tournaments a year. So I, we try to limit that as well, but for any kid listening out there, don't, don't blow out your arm playing with ball. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah, I actually, I mean, I didn't blow out my arm, but it, it was not a good situation. It was close. So yeah, I've, I've started to take care of my arm a lot. A lot good. better, which is good. Nice. Uh, so for game day at the Meadows, like what's the behind the scenes? Like how long does it take to set up the field? Or not necessarily because there's some things you have to set up. And then like the different camera angles, how do you like get all that going? Yeah, so say if we start at 1 p.m. on a Sunday for like first pitch, I'll usually get to the Meadows around, I want to say 1130. Um, 
and me and Daniel and Tommy will pretty much be the three setting up the field. So um, Daniel will usually take all the banners. So put all the banners up. Um, I'll get all the camera equipment ready. We'll make sure that the, the lines are spray painted nice and nice and white on the field. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bunch of just putting the tripods in the right spot and getting the camera set and filming the intro, which could take up to 10, 15 minutes. So we get it exactly right with me and Tommy. Um, and then that's when you start to see guys kind of filter in and get their warm ups in like 30 minutes till tip or till first pitch. Um, and then we get the pregame shots. So we'll do pregame interviews. We'll get the B roll stuff. Um, we'll get all of that before 1 PM. So I'm running around. I'm always filming. I'm always, I always have like a shot list. I, I want to get, um, Tommy's getting footage. Daniel's making sure the field's looking good. Um, a lot of time there'll be like divots in our like, uh, batter's boxes. So we got to like get some dirt and fill those in same with the pitcher's mound. So it's a lot of like really small stuff, but they, they definitely add up. And it's sometimes it pushes us to pass to our, like our past our start date. But, um, we usually, we usually get them started on time at like a, a 1 PM on a Sunday is when we usually play. So what are your like top five best MLW moments of all time? Top five. Um, I have so many to even name five. Uh, I'd say number one is probably the TVS thing this past year. That was really insane. Um, just meeting all those guys and finally getting like a, a mainstream network feature. That is something that I've never even thought. Well, I mean, I thought it'd be possible, not this year, but I was just really excited for that to happen. So that's probably number one. Um, number two, I really like the Oklahoma series. I think that was pretty like not, yeah, it was, it was kind of like a, a series, a, a very unique series that could potentially change a lot of things in MLW and be like a first of many type of thing. Um, so I thought that was a really cool environment. I'd probably put that in there. Um, number three, I'll probably just group together all the tournaments we've done. Like we've had tournaments where we've had like 57 teams, 42, 45 teams. Um, those are all just like insane because a, you're playing a lot of wiffle ball, but B you're meeting so many fans at the same time. It's just a really cool environment. Um, so I'll put that as number three. Um, I'll say for just like all the good times we had at Colts field in the OG days, like I'm talking like the first two or three years in MLW where it's just like me and Tommy on the team. Like it's a five man league, seven man league. And we're just having fun as little kids playing with ball, like no responsibilities in the world that has to be in there as well. Number five. I don't even know, man. There's, there's so many, maybe, maybe just like traveling to like the NWA tournament or like the U tournament having like a fan fest for the first time ever this past uh, October. That was pretty insane. Uh, we did like a Nike and Dick's event this past November as well. We were doing it with like James McCann of the Mets. That's insane. Um, being on sports center. I have, I'll probably put that in there too. The very first time we were on sports center, cause it's Zach Pirox Rob and left field um, over the monster in a world series game. That was pretty insane too. So I know I just listed like a bunch of things like way past five things, but those kind of all popped to my mind first. Yeah, I'm honestly, I'm surprised that, because I feel like wiffle ball, you see Cornhole on ESPN and that kind of stuff. I feel like wiffle ball could be one of the next things that gets on ESPN or ESPN2, because it's pretty entertaining to watch, to be honest. Oh, yeah, it's it's way more entertaining. I was just seeing like archery or something on on uh, ESPN, and I saw Cornhole, too, and it's like, well, if that if that's going to attract viewers, I'm pretty sure wiffle ball could, too, on a national scale yeah. on TV, on ESPN, so... Uh, I, I definitely don't rule it out and I can see it happening sometime. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to close it out, what can fans of MLW and just people in general uh, like expect from MLW in 2022? That's a great question. Um, Without revealing like anything. Yeah, no, we're, we look to improve everything from year to year. Um, so in production quality, nicer cameras, cooler stuff to the field, some, some field renovation stuff. Um, some more, some more events branching into places we've never traveled to before. Um, more higher quality merchandise, different, uh, different products we've never come out, come out with before. Um, really just amping up everything. That's what we try to do every single year. And I really, uh, nitpick every little thing that has to do with MLW. And, and I, I go through and I'm like, how can I improve this? Even if it's the smallest little tweak, I'd, I'd love to improve everything we have going on from merchandise to tournaments to production quality of our videos um, sponsors, everything. So, uh, look for us to just amp it up. And obviously the league itself is crazy right now with the talent. Um, so you'll yeah. see another draft class coming in. We've identified some, some good players that'll be in the league next year. Um, we have our prospect board going. So, um, managers right now are kind of like deciding who they're, who they're going to want to pick in the draft. So, 
Uh, the talent level will be at an all time high. I know I say that every single year, but it just gets better every single year. Um, so in every facet, just look for us to amp it up and improve our, our league. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta let Drew Davis know that Cobra fans not getting happy. I'm like, I'm, I'm on the edge right now. So oh, I can't, man. I can't trust it. I can't hey, trust it. Who knows, man? It's all, it all just comes down to execution with Drew. He, he gets in those big games and he just gets flustered. If he can just, if he can just some, when he's in those big games, just locked in like one time in advance, like he'll be set. He'll, he just needs to get it done one time. And then, uh, he'll just like ride that. Like, Cause like they'll have, they'll have Flynn back. Flynn hits nukes. Baranowski, I think he'll have a better year. They're solid. They're a solid squad. They're just missing that last piece. They're, they're close though. They're close. Yeah. I'm honestly, I'm in a difficult situation. Cause like, You know, I like the Cobras, but like as the year went on last year, the magic kept getting my eye. And I was like, but they're like kind of rivals. So it's not a good situation. And then they'll be good next year, too, dude. They got Bonham now for the whole year. They'll be up there. I I could see the Mallards point going out of nowhere because I feel like Irwin, I really feel like Irwin is like he could have a crazy year. I just, yeah, I feel like he's very underrated compared to. Him. I agree. He just kind of had a tough transition to like the smaller dimensions because he's played previously on like bigger, way bigger fields and pitching distances and stuff. But yeah, it's pretty interesting you say that because I got the number one pick. Like honestly, one guy can change your entire team in wiffle ball. Obviously, you know that. So mm-hmm. um, if Tommy gets that right, then they could easily just you know make a run. So I think that's gonna do it for episode six. Thank you guys all for listening. Uh, thanks for joining. And yeah, we'll see you in episode seven.